something. But tonight we're uh, going to be in Acts, the book of Acts, chapter number 3. Uh, I want to tell you the most important thing that's happening is not happening at the White House. Right. Amen. It's not even happening at your house. Right. It's happening at God's house. Right. The most important thing in the world is going on where the gospel is being preached. Amen. Not every church is preaching the gospel. I was listening the other day on the Christian radio station and if you it, it boggles my mind that over 50% of the people believe that you can get to heaven without believing that there is a God. Over 50%. That don't even, I can't get my thinking around that. Why would you even believe in heaven if you don't believe that there's a God? And so in chapter 3, uh, we're going to read starting in verse 1 it says now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Think about this, Silver and gold have I none. I must have been a Baptist. <laughs> but such as I have give I thee think about that that's better than silver and gold yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Mm. in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with him into the temple walking and leaping and praising God and all the people saw him walking and praising God and they knew that it was he which set for, for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him let us pray Father I thank you for this privilege to be one more time at your house I pray God that you would show up tonight Father, I pray you will use me just for a little bit that I might say something to encourage, and maybe something to help, to inform, to instruct. God, if there's somebody here lost, we beg you, Lord, please deal with them. Save them, Lord, we pray. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This we see here that the disciples are going to go to church. And that's what I want to preach on. Just a simple thought on going to church. In a world in which the emphasis, Brother Brian, is not church. Even by so-called church people. They nonchalantly, uh, just out of habit, go to church. But I want to say something to you. Don't make a habit of going to church. It is a privilege for you to be here it's a privilege for you to be born again it's a privilege that most of the world don't have there's minority we're the minority Ray that knows God the majority of the church world don't even know God mm -hmm. they don't even think they don't know you can't, you can't even tell they can't even tell you how to get born again in the way of opening what is the benefits of going to church? Well, first of all, there's going to be facts that are given. If you've got a preacher and he ain't giving no facts, you need to get rid of him. Huh? This is serious. 
This is a serious. There is no place on earth more serious than the house of God. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't have a little fun, cut up and laugh. Uh, when me and bro, every time I see Brother Ray, we always cut each other and laugh. But it's all in fun. It's not. It's not personal. But here's a place from this pulpit. There need you need to learn something when you go to church. You need to know more today than you did ten years ago about God. You need to have uh, uh, ears. The Bible says, "He that hath ears, let him hear." A lot of people got these, but they don't have. They don't have the. They're deaf. They can't hear. There's facts, but see, a church is a place where you can receive faith. You know, you come here, beat down the world, man. I mean, the world just beats you to death. But here we get some faith to go another step. It's a place for faith. But you see, this fellow was lame. It was a place of fruit. He came crippled, but he left walking. You know, a lot of times we limp in, but we run out. There's some fruit that's dispensed at the house of God. But, you know, church is a friendly place. I hate these churches where they ain't, you, you, they, you just don't want to be around them. This is one of the friendliest places I've ever been. From day one, it ain't about what you are in life, where you, what you have attained in life. It ain't about that. You're just a person, that's all. It ain't about your position. Friendly. But you know, church is a forgiving place. You know where I got forgiven? At church. Huh? I'm not saying you can't get forgiven out there, but I'm saying this is what happens here. This is the motive. This is the, the mission of the church is to see people get forgiven. Now, with that being said, I want to look first of all at the trip to church. Look at this. It says in verse 1, Peter and John went up together into the temple. Church, the trip, first of all, it's an upward trip. See, the fellow who went down to Jericho, he fell amongst thieves and robbers. See, when you go down, it's trouble. But when you go up, it's blessings. Huh? He said, I, he said, I went to church, and you know what? I felt better after I got there than when I had originally gotten there. If you leave worse, something's wrong. Uh, see, church is a place to where you can get uplifted and you can make another day. I was telling my wife on the way up here, uh, boy, a lot of times when I leave work, Brother Ray, I feel pretty filthy because the people, the language that they use, I can't stop them. But the language is horrible. And no matter what you do, it's like you, you can't get these people. It's like they don't have a brain. You can't get them to understand you don't want to hear it. But I want to say, I don't hear that when I come here. I hear good news. Even amongst the bad news, I hear good news. Hey, I know it's bad out there. I know there's trouble out there. But I'm hung up here. The devil's trying to stop me. But you know what? The bad news shows us what the good news is. Because the bad news has to be because the good news is Jesus is coming and he says, Know ye this, in the last days perilous times will come. You ought to wake up and smell the coffee, my friend, because these has to happen so Jesus can come back. It's upward. But did you see... Church, the trip to church should be a church, uh, united trip. It says Peter and John looked like they went together. They were united. You know, for us to ever do anything as Christians, we have to pull together. We have to realize these folks, ain't, we're not against each other. We're, those that are against us are out there. Now I do know this, the devil puts some people in the church to slow it down. Amen? Uh, he does. 
He even puts preachers in churches to slow them down. But as a whole, God's motive for us is to unite as one mighty army and march through this world and proclaim that Jesus died and rose again and he seeks to save sinners. That's his goal. He's, he, uh, he's not interested in the NBA. He ain't interested. He ain't interested in UK. He ain't interested in that. He ain't interested. He ain't even interested in the Bengals. He never, he never lost one ounce of sleep thinking about the Bengals winning or losing. He didn't think about it. Hmm? You know what his motive is? To see somebody get up out of the gutter. That's what his motive is. To see somebody that's lost and on their way to hell get up out of there. And he unites us as an army to fight for what's right. And the reason we're in the shape we're in is because we haven't fought. Uh, we're killing millions of unborn babies and nobody fights for them it's a shame when the unborn in the mother's womb is the dangerous place you could live uh, it's a shame disgrace unto the Christian world see the trip to church I I've noticed in churches it's become robotic it moves real stiff you know huh but church should be an uncertain place you should never come knowing what's going to happen you should never come thinking you're going to hear preaching you should come thinking you can see Jesus you should come thinking you can feel Jesus you should come thinking that the Holy Ghost would blow through this place and we would be here for a day uncertain do you know what we like we like two songs and a a sermonette and a poem that's what we like because we like to have it in our hands. We like church in our hands so we can control it. God ain't, that ain't the type of God. He won't be controlled by nobody. He's the controller. Uh, God, it's un uncertain. You know, you think about this fella, Brother Josh. He never dreamed in his wildest imagination that he would walk home. Think about it. Uh, think about that I try to think how could you heal somebody that's lame how can you do it I can't, it blows my mind I can't comprehend that that's beyond my uh, brain power to understand it but he said that there was people brought him there every day to the temple to beg he never dreamed that that was his last day of begging huh Huh? It was uncertain. You know, second thing is the time at church. What is what are we doing here? Huh? Why are we here? You know, it was prayer time. They was praying. What do you think they done when they got him healed? They didn't just go over there and him get up under their power. They were talking to God. God's the only one who has healing power. Uh, Benny Hinn ain't got it. I, I don't mean to bust your bubble. Uh, he don't have that kind of power. But there is a God in heaven. That's what Daniel said. There is a God in heaven. You know what he can do? He can answer prayers. Uh, I was listening to a preacher last night on the way home from work and uh, he, he pastors a rather large ch church uh, down south of here and he said this week twice I've had two people on the call me and rebuke me because I am calling for revival he said they said and they are preachers he said preacher you need to stop there, don't you know we're living in the last days there's no revival that's why there ain't no revival that's right. 
because you don't want no revival. I'm not saying, I don't ever recall, Brother Ray, there ever being a worldwide revival. But you could have revival. Brother Don, you could be revived. I ain't interested in the whole world. I just like to get a spark for myself. Uh, I'd like to get a little fire in my life. Uh, I've noticed if you've ever built a fire, if you throw one piece in and catch it on fire, you put another piece in, it won't be long before that piece catches on fire. And you keep throwing them in before you know it. The whole place is hot. Uh, uh, we would do good if we could just actually believe God could do something for us. Uh, we pray prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I uh, pray the Lord. Whatever. And by the time you get done, you're asleep. Uh, time at church. This, this time is very important. Uh, you know you might learn just one thing just one thing and that'll be one thing that you didn't know when you got here I find in my life that most people are looking for the whole place to be on fire and they miss all the little things uh, the time did you know the time at church was a powerful time to see this guy that nobody don't even know who he is he's a crippled he comes in under the power of his friends and he leaves probably skipping and hopping and jumping and saying praise God I can walk praise God Praise God. We said we know he leaped in, you know. I'd say he was leaping when he got home. Uh, <clears throat> powerful. I was preaching one time up in Cincinnati, and uh, I, sometimes I, I can't control myself. Uh, I taught Sunday school, and, uh, and I'm nothing. I want you to know I said, I don't know, I ain't nothing. There was about 10 people. One family came in, and they sit in the back. And when he called me up to preach, every one of them was sitting playing on their phone. Now, I'm going to be honest. If you know me, my blood is boiling. But I didn't say nothing. Hmm. Do you know how disrespectful? Huh? Do you know how disrespectful? Not to the preacher. That they would disrespect God's house like that. No wonder our churches are powerless. I, I, when I was pastor and I had, well, I had a bunch of people didn't like me. <laughs> I just have that effect on people. You know, I don't mean to be, but it just sometimes it works out like that. And this lady, she would come and she would sit and she would look at a magazine while I, read, while I preached. Now I want to say, I never did say nothing to her. But she died last year. 54 years old. She died last year. She's got two boys and none of, their, none of her family is in church. See, she didn't do anything to me. She did something to her kids. These people come. I'm amazed. Me and my wife was at Cracker Barrel today. Here's a grunt. We're, we're blaming these kids for all the how messed up they are. You, you adults need to go, you need to check up on yourself. Here's two grown people. I guess I was assuming they're husband and wife. They're as old as I am. They're sitting at a table right across from me. They never spoke to each other, but they played on their phones. I'm saying, wow. That must be a miserable life. Uh, do you know how much damage is being done in the church by people coming to church and playing on the phone? That's why we're losing our power. They're more interested in some goofy game or some text message. What, what is going on? What is going on? We're losing our power because people don't respect God. It ain't about Brother Doug. 
I'm not disrespecting him. I, I love him. I respect him. That's why you ain't going to see me reading no magazine. While he's preaching. Even while they're singing. Sitting there and fiddling with a phone. See, if I was God, I just sometimes I'd like to be him just for a little bit. <laughs> on your third time of playing on your phone, I would go Zip, like that and I'd just melt that thing right in your lap. Amen. Say how you like it. Amen. Huh? You think, Brother Brian, that I'd send my only begotten son to die on the cross of Calvary and I'd put up with you in my church? Playing with the phone. I wouldn't do that. Amen. He loves you a whole lot more than I do. Huh? People come, you know, they'll come to church and it takes the FBI to find them next Sunday. They won't come back on Sunday night. Huh? The Secret Service couldn't find them. Huh? You say, well, they're uh, providentially hindered. Yeah, let me tell you, let me explain to you what most of that is. They don't want to come. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just being honest you know amen that's why power anytime you lose power you know we lost power in that storm for a little bit our lights went out We're, I'm thinking man it's 8 degrees out <laughs> it's not good to have no power when it's 8 degrees and by the grace of God about 5 minutes it come back on you know, God's power ain't being coming on right now. And it's not His fault. Huh? It ain't His fault. You know. It's like one fella, him and his wife were talking. And she said, you know, you don't hold my hand anymore. When we were dating, said, you would hold my hand and you would say all these things to me and you don't say nothing. And he said, well, you know, darling, when we were dating, you sat over here next to me. I'm still sitting here. Where are you at? Huh? She's sitting over there next to the window. Huh? Where are we sitting at? We're losing power not because of God, but we got all these interruptions from everywhere. All these electronic devices. <clears throat> Yesterday, the kid that come in to, to do my job at night, I was talking to him. And uh, I said, well, you have a good weekend. He said, I can't wait to get home. I said, well, you got 12 hours to do it, brother. Uh, he said, I said, why is that? He said, I've got me a new video game. I was like, hallelujah. Everything I wanted in life. And so I wanted to be nice, so I tried to show a little interest, which I could care less. But I didn't want to be a jerk. And so he gets to describe in this game, it was some kind of war game where you can make all these, uh, he said there's, there's the levels, you know, where there's alligator men and all this. And, and I got my, to drive off and I said, I'd rather somebody put a gun to the back of my head and pull the trigger. It's for me to know that that's what I'm going to be doing on my days off. Uh, uh, seriously. That's what excites us today. I said, I told Rhonda, I said, the reason they like that is it's fantasy. Because reality is a little bit rougher. Then we don't have no alligator men. See, it's powerful. This is a powerful place. But it's only as powerful as you let it. See, you know, Brother Doug can do all he can do to get this thing to, to go straight down the road, but if you lean over, it's not going to work. It depends on you. It depends on me. You know, faithfulness. You know, you know the Bible commands us, he said, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. You know, you're supposed to be here every time you can. Not just because you got the hiccups. Huh? Unless you're dying of them. <laughs> you know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, about the last days, he says, except there come a falling away first. There's going to be a time when people fall away from the church. I don't like it, but that's the way it has to be. See, 
the time at church is a praising time. You know, uh, I'd love to see somebody get saved, wouldn't you? Sure. Huh? Sure. Huh? I like to see people get touched. I, I, was, uh, I was touched this morning. Amen. People praising. I was touched by the message. Uh, that was good. Huh? I, I was telling Brother Donald, you know, I have to work on Wednesday. I get home uh, just about the time the church starts. And uh, Ron and I, we turned it on. And the first thing we saw was Bella singing. Good deal. And then Donald got up. And I like songs where they're, you can't make out what they're singing. He could have been singing Led Zeppelin. I wouldn't have known it. But at least he was enjoying it. <laughs> Praise him. This time, I'm telling you, we've, folks, we, it ain't about all that you got. It's all that he has of you. What has he done? What has he done for you? He's only got you out of your sins. He's only saved you out of the lake of fire. That's all He's done. That's all. Huh? He's only made you a part of a royal family. That's all. Not Really not a big deal, right? Not a big deal. Huh. Huh? Now look at the church. It's a place that you can get touched. Did you see this? Uh, he says, verse 2, a certain man unknown there's a certain see when you come to church you'll never know who it's going to be that sparks the mode of church it don't have to be the pastor it can be the kids uh, it's someone who's as we would say insignificant some no name do you know there's a lot of no names in God's family that's doing great things to bring him glory uncertain just a certain that's the touch God touched this person who was a beggar and you know I don't know if you you know in, when I come around people asking for money I, I, I have this attitude they're, they've got a Rolls Royce sitting somewhere because you know you've seen them on 60 Minutes where they've followed these people and they get in a Lexus and drive off <laughs> that's the truth so you know it makes you say I don't want to help nobody but I'm sure they're not all that way I don't know but you know at the touch of church is that there's people who get changed if you're not getting changed even after you got saved there's something wrong with you or something wrong with the church huh? see because the church with the Holy Spirit in here, what it does is He goes around walking up and down these pews and He begins to take what the preacher or what the song is saying and He begins to minister and He begins to change people's lives. And that change, what it does is it sparks you to where you can go out and fight another fight. How He changes people. But you know, church was they they got charged up at church. The world don't charge me up too much. Huh? Here's a guy. He look in verse eight said he leaping up stood and walked entered into the temple. He was walking, leaping, praising God. Sounds to me like he he didn't just come in like the average Baptist. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, he was happy. Huh? You know what? If you really got to thinking about what all's went in into this thing and what you are doing and what God's done for us, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be uh, as as lackadaisical as we are. Sure. We'd be charged, energized. Uh, this place is like a you know uh, a place to charge your batteries. Amen. Uh, you, you ever have your battery on your car run down? You leave the light on. My grandson years ago. He left the light on in the dome light. And I went out and that car was dead as a mackerel, man. It took me all day long to charge that battery. Because there wasn't an ounce of juice in that battery. See, it run out of power. But you know what? This is a place right here because this place is so important. This place, and you're a part of that. You are a part of that. 
This place and any other church that preaches the gospel is a place that you can get charged up for God. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now, you see the testimony of a church. Every church has one. Yeah, they all have them. What do you mean? Some churches, they're dry. They're dry as cracker dust. That's dry. Uh, do you know, the testimony of a church at this church here was someone got help. Do you know what a good church does? It helps people. I, I, you know, I've never been around so many people. They'll have hordes of money, and they'll have one family, and they want to get, they want to get all kinds of information about their family. I'm like, the people are starving, man. We don't want to help them. Huh? You know, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. The reason you repented was because God done something for you that you didn't deserve. Huh? You know what this church needs to do and what this church does? It is helps people. Amen. Spiritually and any other way. Huh? But it's good to the, the preachers that come here. Uh, it's good to the people that come here. Uh, people get help. You know, we're living in a world that has no hope. They have no help. You know, they think, uh, you know, everybody thinks that... Uh, the only resource of help is alcohol. But it won't help you. It won't help you. It'll leave you just as miserable when you wake up as before you went to sleep. But I've never got help from the, from the local church that didn't last. It lasted. You know, keeps me coming back. You know... It, it not only helps, but it heals people. The church does. Yes, uh, you know, there's broken homes that's been healed in the church. Yes. The church will take some people that's out of whack with each other. And through the preaching of the Word of God, and through power of prayer, families will get saved and families will do right. Hmm? And that, that's, that's a good thing. Yes. People getting healed spiritually. See... We don't have, everybody thinks our problems are, they're trying to fix our problems, Brother Phil, with finances. Amen. That's all they talk about is the economy, the economy, the economy. That's not our problem. Our problem is spiritual. You cannot fix this problem that we have without God. You must get the healer involved in the broken, wicked families of America for it to get right. Amen. Uh, you cannot fix it. Amen. You cannot fix this by better education. That's why we're in the mess we're in now. Yeah. These people are so smart, they've walked off and left God sitting at the church. Right. You know? The only thing that you find with people getting smarter is they don't need God anymore. I've never went to a doctor's office. Now, I'm not saying there's not... I know of one that's a Christian. I know one Christian doctor. I'm not saying they're not. But the ones that I've dealt with, they're so arrogant because they're so smart, they've got it all ciphered out. It's usually those that don't know is the ones that gets help. Hmm. Another testimony is God gets honored. I, was, uh, I try to encourage Brother Doug or whoever preaches and I won't lie to them. I, I, I just say, you know, I enjoyed the message. And Doug will always say, let God have the glory. Right. Let Him be honored. Right. You know, everything that we do, well, ultimately, the goal is that God is honored in it. Uh, God gets all the glory out of it. Why? Because He's the one who deserves it. You didn't send your son to Calvary. Mm -hmm. you didn't heal somebody you didn't do that 
I didn't do that. It was God who done that. He was the one who helps. He's the one who, uh, you know, you say, a lot of times we want to think, well, it was just kind of like an accident to how this happened. No, it ain't never no accident. It's a divine intervention of God putting two to two together to make four. That's how it works, friend. Right. God takes this church and what he does is he sends us out and when it's all said and done we say praise his name. Thank him for what he's done. Give him honor and glory for what he's done. That's what happens. Now, church, we're going to close right here with this. The temperament of church. Every church has a temperament. You know, every person has one. Hmm? Uh, some of them just have the first part of it temper right. not temperament <laughs> you'll catch that uh, what how the church is did you notice that these people here were compassionate they saw this guy they didn't have two dimes to rub together you know what they said look look he says uh in verse 6, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. He said, yeah, I know you need money, but I ain't got none of that. He said, I'm in the same shape you're in. <laughs> but he said, what I do have, I'll give it to you. Uh, you know what we have? We need to give it to them. Uh, they don't need money. Now that might be what they want. That might be what they think will fix their problem. That will not fix their problem. They'll just have the same problem with more money. What they need is compassion. Uh, people who will be like that good Samaritan and go down and take him and put him on his own beast and haul him over to the inn and say, when I come back, I'll pay his bill. Uh, compassion. The world's going to hell, my friend. It's a scary thought. Do you know how close your loved one that's lost might be to hell? My loved one. Hmm? You know what David said when Saul was chasing him? He said, there's only a step between me and death. I want to say this, my friend, while the church is being rocked to sleep by the devil thousands and upon thousands are dropping off into eternity in hell that's just the truth of it listen there see at church there's no charge there's no cost we've got uh, we're not begging for money we don't need your money if you're a Christian you'll pay your tithes Amen. We, you know what I find, brother uh, Josh, is we're we're trying to get lost people to act like they're saved. They can't do that. They can't dress like they're saved. They can't walk like they're saved because they're not saved. Huh? <laughs> you know why my dog barks? Because he's a dog. Why he? chases the cat he's a dog huh? and you can't expect a lost person to act like a saved person and if they did act like that it'd make them a twofold child of hell listen to this did you know in this church there was no challenges that couldn't be met think about it I, I've tried, and I've said earlier, I've tried to get it in my mind. How do you fix a person who's lame? I can't figure it out. I really can't. It blows my mind. But you know what, Brother Ray? It was no challenge to God. He didn't go up there and say, this is going to be a rough one. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do this. But you know, you'd think a fella uh, that had took and scooped up dirt and he, he breathed into their mouth and the guy stood up, it wouldn't be no challenge for him to fix it. 
You know, wouldn't be no, it wouldn't be no big deal. I want to say this, my friend. We look at things and we think this will never happen, but there's no challenges to God. God can fix your family if you've got lost family members. He can save them. He's he. Let me say this before I close. He's more interested in your lost family than you are, because you haven't died for them. You haven't sent nobody to die for them. But he did. Huh? Do you think about that? What a God that would do such a like that. If you've got somebody that's, if you get serious, if we'd just get serious about this thing of being a child of God and we'd call out on God and believe him, he'd do something. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I get kind of discouraged. And I'm going to tell you why. The attitude of a lot of people that won't go to church, that profess to be saved, that, that bugs me. It really does. It, it hurts me. You know why? Because they're supposed to be part of this family. All across. I'm going to say this before I close. Over 30 years ago, my brother, he moved to northern Indiana to pastor a little church. In northern Indiana, there's not one kind of church, I don't care what kind of church you mention, has church services on Sunday night. That's 30 years ago. My brother tried to start every other Sunday night. They would none of them come. Thirty over thirty years. Friend, I want to tell you something. It's moving south. People are not interested. I'm glad you are. But you know what? There's a reason why these people don't come back. And it's not all providential. This right in here. Huh? A lot of it's right in here. I'm just going to be brutal, brutally honest. People do what they want to do. They do what they want to do. Hmm? And church is not important to a lot of people. But it's important to God. Amen. Brother Josh, you come. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.